Hey everyone, how's it going? Uh, I've got another short little lecture for you again. Probably some stuff that's a, a little bit more review. Certainly if you've had Cell Bio, this is all going to be very much a review. I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page here. So we're going to talk about um, cellular division. And as I mentioned earlier, when we were just talking about the cell, you know, why do we need to know this? Because all living things are made of cell. It's the building block of all organisms. All cells come from other cells. Um, and so to be able to understand biology, you just have to understand things at the cellular level. So let's talk about that. Uh, of course, most organisms are unicellular, you say. Really? So we think about how many bacteria are out there. And in the history of the world, most organisms were unicellular. The history of life has been just one of bacteria, prokaryotes. Um, and so, of course, cellular division means reproduction. The cell divides and, and you re reproduce the entire organism. But, um, you know, we're multicellular. There's lots of multicellular organisms these days. And so you need cellular division for example, to grow from a fertilized egg. All of us started out as a single cell, right? And now you're trillions upon trillions of cells. And so how did you grow from one cell to what you are today? Of course, you had to have cellular division. And just in general, any kind of growth, you need cellular division. Um, but also cells are being damaged and destroyed and just age all the time. And so you need to repair cells. You need cellular division. So obviously it's something that's quite important. So there's two types of cell division we're going to talk about. Mitosis is a division of somatic cells or body cells, um, non-gonadal cells. So everything except the gonads or everything except the sex cells is a somatic cell. And in mitosis, you start with one cell and you end up with two identical cells and those are called daughter cells. In the sex cells, to create gametes, we have meiosis. And so meiosis creates eggs and sperm. Um, and in meiosis, you still start out with one cell, and it's a diploid cell with the full complement of DNA. You end up with four haploid cells. So four cells, each of which have half the chromosome, and each of those cells are unique. So whereas in mitosis, the the resulting cells are identical to each other. In meiosis, they're all unique. And so to remember these, um, mitosis has an I and a T in it, stands for identical twins. So the cells that are left over are identical twins. Meiosis has an E and an S in it, gives eggs and sperm. So that may help. Okay. And so in this example, or in this lecture today, we're just going to be talking about mitosis. Um, and so division of the somatic cells. And so a somatic cell um, normally will just grow and get larger. Then it will replicate its DNA, make copies of all the DNA. Then it's going to grow some more. And then it's going to divide into two identical cells. And so this process at the start where the cell grows and then it replicates the DNA and then it grows some more, that's called interphase. And then when it splits, that process is called mitosis. And so cells are constantly just going through interphase mitosis, interphase mitosis, interphase mitosis. That's the life cycle of a cell. So interphase is about 90% of the cell cycle. So most of the time your cell is just growing replicating DNA, growing some more. We can divide this into subphases. G1, or the first gap phase, that's when the cell's growing. Um, then that's followed by S. S is the synthesis phase. That's when the DNA is replicated. And then you've got G2, the second gap, where the cell grows some more. Now, of course, the cell biology, you talk about those in much more detail. There's a lot more going on, but that's the basic idea. And so here's a figure from your book, just kind of showing the relative proportions of each of these cycles. So it's always G1, S, G2 in interphase. Then you undergo mitosis. And then the actual process of splitting in two is called cytokinesis. 
And so some people consider cytokinesis as part of mitosis, some don't, it doesn't really matter, but cytokinesis always immediately follows mitosis. And just another diagram of that, only this one is in 3D. Are you impressed? Okay, during S phase, um, this is when your chromosomes become replicated. So you remember a chromosome is a long strand, one piece of DNA, right? DNA is a long linear molecule. And so that one long piece of DNA is a chromosome. And so during interphase, uh, these chromosomes are stretched out and they can't be seen with a microscope. During mitosis, they condense to where they can be seen. So in each of your cells, you have something like three meters worth of DNA. And you've got trillions of cells. Every cell has all your DNA and it's three meters long, uh, you know, which is uh, almost nine feet. So you say, how do you get that much DNA into a single nucleus of a single cell, well, it has to be incredibly, incredibly, incredibly thin. And so when it's uncondensed and stretched out, it's so thin you can't see it with a microscope. But when it condenses during mitosis, then you can see it with a light microscope. So during S phase, it's, you can't see the DNA, but it is replicated and it's copied. And so you make a perfect copy of every single chromosome. That way, when the cell divides, each cell can get a full complement of all the DNA. When a chromosome was copied, you start off with one chromosome and it's copied and now you have two sister chromatids. And so these are identical chromosomes, but they're still joined. They're joined at the waist and where they're joined is called the centromere. And so this allows them to travel together uh, until you're ready to separate them and then send them off into the new cells. And so again, here I'm just trying to show you that each single, each chromosome is stretched out. It's a very long, thin molecule. And then this gets copied. And we're going to talk about this in more detail when we get into genetics about how the DNA gets copied. But the whole DNA gets copied except for that part around the centromere. Um, that just doesn't replicate so it can hold the sister chromatids together. And then when you rip them apart, you copy that last little bit. And so now you have two identical sister chromatids, but they're still joined at the centromere. Now you can't see this with a microscope when it happens. This is occurring during S phase when they're stretched out. They're too skinny, they're too drawn out. Um, you'll be able to see the nucleus. This is all happening inside the nucleus, but you won't be able to see specific chromosomes like you can later in mitosis. I also wanna make sure that you're comfortable. Make sure you know all these different terms and all this vocabulary, because this is all just, these are all important terms and they'll come up again and again. Now realize that at this point we consider that you still have one chromosome in this example but that chromosome is replicated so it's made it consists of two sister chromatids so at this point after s phase you have twice the normal complement of dna but you still have the same number of chromosomes right so you you've got the, no, the, the regular diploid number of chromosomes, but each one is replicated. So each one has got, is made of two identical copies. Does that make sense? It's a very subtle distinction, but it's something important. By under, you know, you really need to, when we talk about mitosis and, and, and later on meiosis, you really need to understand how the chromosomes relate to one another, where they are in each part of the cellular cycle, and that helps you to understand the entire process. And so for me, this is, this is just the way I do it. If you want to know how many chromosomes you got in the cell, count centromeres. Because so in this example, we've got one chromosome and it's got one centromere. On the right, that chromosome has been replicated. So now we've got two chromatids, but it's still one chromosome because those chromatids are still connected by that centromere. Okay, so that occurs during interphase. 
and then um, so, you know, that, that's the S part of interphase, and you have G2, and then we're ready to enter mitosis. And so mitosis has some very specific phases, and they always come in the same order. So it goes pro, uh, excuse me, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. And then after these phases, then you get cytokinesis, which is when the cell splits in two. And so, just showing you the same diagram again, where uh, how cytokinesis follows mitosis, and then each of the daughter cells begins G1 again. And you need to know these, you need to know what happens in each of these. Again, we're not going into as much detail as you would in something like cell bio, but I want you to know the, the general idea of what, what goes on during each of these phases. You need to know what they're called, you need to know what order they're in. And so um, you got prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, cytokinesis. Those all follow interphase, and then it starts all over again. So uh, this is how I remember them. I pee more after this Coke. Interphase, metaphase, excuse me, interphase, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, cytokinesis. All right? Okay, so prophase is when those chromosomes start to condense. And so then now you can start to see them with a microscope. So you got that long strand of DNA and it starts to wrap around proteins and then those proteins wrap around other proteins and it wraps around itself and it, it makes like a spirally old foam cord. So you can take this long skinny thing and you can condense it down to something much smaller that can be seen. This is when you get the classic X pattern. You know, whenever you draw a chromosome, you kind of draw them as X's. This is Y, because when you see them in prophase is when you get that classic X pattern. Now, some of you are very young. This is what's known as a phone cord. Phones used to have cords and they coiled up and wrapped up like this. So anyway, when the DNA starts to condense, it starts to look a little bit like one of these cords. And you can see how you can take something long and straight and by wrapping it up, you can make it much more condensed. And again, here's the, the, you know, the classic X pattern of a chromosome. Remember, this is one chromosome, but it's made of two sister chromatids. They're identical. Also during prophase, this is when um, the centrosomes replicate, and this is just a, a small organelle in the cell. We haven't really talked about them yet. But the centrosomes start to, f to form, start to build big, microtub use microtubules to build something called the mitotic spindle. So you do remember, we, we talked about the, the uh, cytoskeleton a little bit, and we talked about microtubules were the biggest fibers that made up the cytoskeleton. And we talked about it's the internal scaffolding within the cell, and when things move around the cell, they often move along these fibers. Well, this is a good example. And so during prophase, we start to form these great big microtubules or use these microtubules to form this mitotic spindle, which is gonna help us move chromosomes around the cell. And so here's a figure from your book kind of showing this. And so these uh, uh, centrosomes replicate and they move to opposite sides of the cell. And as they do, they grow this mitotic spindle in between them and it's made of microtubules. In this example, you can also see the chromosomes are starting to become visible. And you can see that they're still sister chromatids joined at the centro, uh, centromere. Okay, so this mitotic spindle attaches to those chromosomes, and this is how we can wrestle those chromosomes into position. And so it starts to move the chromosomes, and during metaphase, those chromosomes line up in the middle of the cell, or along the equator. And so that's how, one way to remember, uh, chromosomes go to the middle during metaphase. And you can see how this diagram from your book is showing uh, that mitotic spindle has moved those chromosomes into a single line along the equator there. This is metaphase. Now, how many chromosomes do we have at this stage? Again, count the centromeres, all right? And so, in this particular example, you've got four chromosomes that they're showing you. Now, each of those has been replicated, so you have twice the normal amount of DNA, but it's still only organized in the, in the same number of chromosomes. And so here's just another kind of more three-dimensional figure, again, showing you 
how those microtubules attach to the chromosome and how they're used to help move the chromosomes into position. Where the microtubules attach is called the kinetochore. And the kinetochore is, is just a, a group of proteins excuse me, that allow that mitotic spindle to attach to every chromosome. And they attach at the centromere. And so again, here, this figure from your book is showing those two terms. And sometimes they're kind of used interchangeably, but they're not quite the same thing. The centromere is this region where the two sister chromatids are still attached together. The kinetochore is a bunch of proteins where that mitotic spindle attaches. So, you know, but it's in the same region of the chromosome. Okay, after metaphase, we get anaphase. Anaphase is where we finally rip apart those sister chromatids. And so now each one is a separate chromosome. And as they get ripped apart, they get pulled toward opposite ends. So now at this point is where you have two daughter chromosomes because they're completely independent of each other. Also, um, when you're trying to look at a microscope and you're trying to decide you know, what phase you're looking at, I think anaphase is real easy to see because the chromosomes are getting pulled. So imagine, you know, you've got that, those chromosomes in an X and then you separate the X and where that kinetochore is, that's what starts moving and pulling the chromosome. And so it's being pulled, it's like somebody attached a, a rope to your belt and pulled you. And so you can see that kinetochore being pulled and then the, the arms of the chromatids or the arms of the chromosome kind of spreading backwards. So you can see they're kind of drawing that in this picture here. You can see how each of those chromosomes is now being pulled by, uh, by the centromere to either end of the cell, okay? And so again, how many chromosomes count the centromeres? In this example, now we have eight chromosomes because that each of those chromosomes has been pulled apart. So technically, you know, for a split second of mitosis, this cell um, is polyploid. It's got twice as many chromosomes as it normally does. That's actually kind of a cool fact, and it's something we'll talk about later. Um, you know, sometimes when you have a hiccup during, during uh, anaphase, or you have a hiccup during anaphase of meiosis, um, you know, the, the cell didn't divide, the cell can end up with twice as many chromosomes, and this is how we can get organisms that are polyploid. We'll talk about that in more detail later. I want you to know these details now. And so again, look for that V shape. That V shape are those chromosomes where, you know, they're being grabbed by the centromere and pulled toward one side of the cell. Okay. Um, final phase is telophase. At telophase, the nuclear membranes begin to reform. So the nuclear membrane dissolves in prophase. That's how you're, you can pull these chromosomes apart. Remember, they're inside the nucleus. So you've got to get rid of that nuclear membrane so that you can move those, those sister chromatids apart. So now the nuclear membrane begins to reform on either end. The chromosomes begin to stretch out again. They had been condensed. Now they're starting to stretch out again. And the microtubules disappear. That mitotic spindle starts to disappear. And so that's what they're showing you here. They're showing you that those chromosomes are starting to stretch out. They're showing that now you have two nuclei because the nuclear membrane is reforming. That mitotic spindle is starting to disappear. And then you have cytokinesis. So now you can pinch the cell in two and you can have two identical cells. So in animals, this occurs by a cleavage furrow. And so a cleavage furrow, it's just like uh, if you had a balloon and you tied a string around the balloon and then you started to pull that string tight, it would pinch in, pinch in, pinch in, pinch in, pinch in, pinch in. Um, I don't know if you've ever made your own sausages, but if you make your own sausage and then you twist the sausage and then it pinches in and pinches in and pinches in, same idea, that's a cleavage furrow. In plant cells, they just form a cell plate. So they just grow a new cell wall across between the two new daughter cells. 
And so this is kind of a cool three-dimensional picture. And you can see, imagine what I'm saying. Like you've got, you know, a string or something or a drawstring uh, on a, a, a bag or something like that where you pull it tight and it starts to just pinch in and it eventually pinches into two new cells. That's what animal cells do. And uh, in plant cells, they form that cell plate. Okay, so let's look at microscope pictures of each of these again. Now these are from plant cells. It's fine, right? The only difference is, is you've got the cell walls here. Everything else is the same. And so here you can see prophase. And so you can see those chromosomes are starting to condense. Um, the, the nucleus is starting to dissolve and the mitotic spindle is starting to form. Here's metaphase. So those chromosomes have been wrestled and moved to the center of the cell. Here's anaphase. And so if you look closely, you can kind of see that V pattern. You can see where those chromosomes, those they used to be sister chromatids, are being grabbed by the center and pulled to either end. Telophase, again, this is a plant cell we're looking at. So that cell plate is starting, starting to form. Otherwise, it would be a cleavage furrow and the chromosomes are starting to, uh, to stretch back out. And so if you looked at a slide, you'd have lots of cells and you can go through and you can look um, at each one of these cells and you can sort of guess what phase it's in. And then you can tally those up and it can tell you like how long they spend in each of the cells in each of the stages. Okay. So again, very broad 10,000 foot view of the cell cycle and cellular division. Now, what controls this in the cells? You know, normally, if you're growing, you've got to have active mitosis. You got to produce new cells to grow. Also, you've got to replace old cells. So once you, you know, you reach puberty and you stop growing, you know, you, like you stop growing in height, but you might, you know, fill out or, you know, if you're working out and building muscle, but mostly once you reach puberty, now you just got old cells dying, new cells being produced. But if you don't need new cells, then the cell division stops, right? You, you know, and so once the cells grow and, and they, they've got something called contact inhibition where there, there's plenty of good functioning cells, they don't need to divide, then they don't divide. You know, they just get hung up in G1 or G2 phase. But what happens if they don't stop? What happens if cellular division is uncontrolled? Well, that's what cancer is. That's when the cancer is when the cells just keep dividing and don't stop when they're supposed to stop and it creates a tumor. And so, you know, this is a disease that's common to all living organisms at some level or another. Um, it's one of the top killers of human beings. And so it's something that you know, we all study, we need to know about. Um, many of us have experience with it. My father had uh, uh, skin cancer. Um, you know, had other relatives who've, who've passed away due to cancer. Um, so by understanding it, <clears throat> that helps us to learn how to treat it. And so again, cancer is when the cells get stuck in mitosis. They keep dividing even though you don't need them to. And so what happens is, is you get a big lump of tissue and that's what a tumor is, a big lump of tissue that comes from unstopped, unchecked cellular division. Now, if that tumor does not affect nearby tissue, if it just stays in the one tissue type where it started and it doesn't grow, it doesn't go, and doesn't go anywhere, that's a benign tumor. And so if you um, you know, it might be pressing on something, it might be in a, in a spot that um, interferes with something else, but usually it's not anything dangerous. And if you can do surgery and cut it out, you can get rid of it. However, sometimes these tumors start to grow and then they begin to infiltrate nearby tissue. And that is when a tumor becomes malignant, when it's in a different kind of tissue. And this is when um, they start to become more dangerous. And so a malignant tumor can metastasize, which means it has invaded nearby tissue and it can start to release cancerous cells. 
So when that, that you know, original cell begins to divide uncontrollably, remember that the end result are two identical daughter cells. And so those identical daughter cells will also grow uncontrollably and their daughter cells will grow uncontrollably, okay? And so any cell that gets shed by the tumor will also be cancerous, will also grow uncontrolled. And so if the tumor metastasizes, you can spread those cancerous cells throughout the body and they can settle somewhere else and they can start to grow. And so that's when the cancer starts to spread through, through your body and that's when it becomes much more difficult to control and that's when you're in trouble. And so this is just a figure kind of showing, um, you know, normal cell division. One cell leads to two cells. Each new cell leads to another cell. And then something goes wrong and one of these cells um, begins to divide uncontrollably. And so then all the resulting cells from that cell divide uncontrollably. That's when you get a tumor. And if the tumor doesn't invade other tissue, it's benign and it's non-cancerous. But if it's invading nearby tissue and affecting nearby tissue, it's malignant, which can become metastatic or can metastasize when it starts to shed those cancerous cells. And again, one cancerous cell, when it lands anywhere, then it's going to reproduce uncontrollably. All the daughter cells are going to reproduce uncontrollably. And so now you've got another tumor somewhere else in the body. Okay, so once that tumor has metastasized and starts shedding these cells, how do they spread throughout the body? A um, very common way is through the lymphatic system. And this is part of the immune system. We'll talk about it in more detail when we talk about the immune system. But basically, you know, your blood plasma um, bathes the cell and, and you've got all this interstitial space between the cells. It's got this liquid. That liquid needs to be collected and then taken back to the blood. That's what the, the lymph, lymphatic system does. And so it's got a series of, of uh, uh, ducts and channels to carry this, much like the circulatory system, but they're a lot smaller. And, um, you know, where the circulatory system circulates throughout your whole body, the lymphatic system it only kind of goes one way. It collects all that interstitial liquid and it moves up. And then you've got these ducts up near your neck where it dumps it back into the bloodstream. At any rate, um, part of this system are the lymph nodes, where this lymph gets filtered. Now, again, this is really important as part of your immune system response because um, you've got a foreign invader that... Uh, um, the immune system attacks and, and what it tries to do is it covers it with antibodies and, and um, the cells come and try and destroy it. Anyway, you've got a lot of things that need to get filtered out and pulled out of your body. And so the lymph nodes are going to capture a lot of this stuff. Well, when this happens, that causes them to swell up. Um, and so that's why when you go see the doctor and the doctor feels around, you know, you've got lymph nodes all through your neck. And, and they're feeling for swollen lymph nodes, and that suggests, okay, your body is fighting off some kind of an infection. Well, you've got these lymph nodes all over your body. And so when these tumors start shedding these cancerous cells, they get in that lymph, and this is gonna be the first place where they're gonna collect. They're gonna collect in that lymph node. And they might settle there, and they might start to form a tumor. But if they don't get filtered out, then they get returned to the blood. Now it's in the bloodstream and now it can get carried anywhere in the body and eventually settle and form a new tumor. Um, and so that's why the lymph nodes are always something that's important for treatment. It's one of the first things we look at. We'll talk about that here in a second when we're talking about treatment. Okay, so why do these cells start dividing uncontrollably? What sets them off on this path? Again, this is a very complicated question, but basically you've got a series of genes who, which control cellular division, which, which enhance cellular division. And you've got other genes that stop cell division. And so these things are always in, in kind of a balance and working together to only have the cell divide when it needs to divide. But if you get a mutation in any of these genes, then they might start functioning improperly. And so now this balance is thrown off and you don't have control and the cell starts dividing uncontrollably.
Obviously, it's a lot more complicated than that, but that's the general idea. Okay, so what are some of the ways that we treat cancer then based upon what we, this little bit that we know now? Uh, the first step is always to try to cut out the tumor. And when you get the tumor, you try to get some of the surrounding tissue. The re reason is, you know, that tumor is made of cells that divide uncontrollably. And all of the cells that the tumor makes are also going to divide uncontrollably. If you don't remove the tumor, then it's just going to keep growing. And if you don't get the whole tumor, if you leave a few cells behind, well, those cells are just going to produce more cells and they're going to produce more cells and the tumor is going to grow right back. So that's why when they cut out the tumor and they take a sample and look at it in a microscope, they're looking at the margins and they're looking to, to see that you've got all the cancerous cells um, plus some good cells. And so you didn't leave any cancerous cells in. That's, that's the goal of removing the tumor. Um, and the longer that tumor remains in the body, the more, the better the chance that it's going to metastasize. Uh, so the sooner you can get to it, the sooner you can get it out, the better your chances of it not spreading throughout your body. Now we mentioned that when it does metastasize, a lot of times the lymph nodes are going to catch these cancerous cells. And so that's why one of, another common thing that's done when you remove the tumor is you also remove a lot of the nearby lymph nodes because if it has metastasized, you can look in the lymph nodes and if you find cells there, then you know that it's starting to spread. Um, but if they're in the lymph nodes, you know, again, you get them out before they form a tumor. This is what happened with my dad's surgery. He had skin cancer on his back. They took the tumor out. They also found it took about a bunch of lymph nodes around it. Um, and so this is to try to catch the, those cancerous cells before they can spread throughout the whole body. Once you get the tumor out, then you're also going to try to kill the cancerous cells so they stop dividing. You know, they're not going to stop dividing on their own, so you just got to just kill those cells, and then they'll stop producing those daughter cells that reproduce uncontrollably. Um, and so there's lots of ways of doing this. Radiation um, is very, if, you, if it's in a spot where you can direct radiation at it, that will break up the DNA of those cells and a lot of times can kill those cells. Um, and chemotherapy is just a series of different kinds of drugs and there's all kinds of different drugs and all kinds of different ways they work but their idea is you're trying to kill those cancerous cells so that they stop producing new cells um, of course the problem is it's not that easy and so you're going to kill non-cancerous cells as well and so for example some types of cells that are very susceptible to chemotherapy are uh, hair cells, intestine cells, white blood cells, part of your immune system. And so that's why you know, people get really sick a lot of times when they're on chemotherapy is because you're, you're killing off the bad cells, but you're also killing off the good cells. And you're, hopefully you can kill off all the bad cells without making yourself too sick. Now there's a lot of work being done, a lot of new drugs these days that are targeting those proteins made by the mutated genes. And so you've got a mutation that causes your cells to divide uncontrollably. Perhaps you can target, you can design a drug that will work on the protein created by that mutated gene. And so you kind of go into the source and it's much more targeted and there's fewer side effects this way. So uh, with my dad's cancer, it was um, a unique kind of cancer and they uh, uh, identified the mutation in it and there's actually a new drug that was designed to work on the, the protein product of that that gene um, and so there's a lot of hope for these kinds of treatments in the future and so it's a lot uh, easier on the patient than traditional chemotherapy okay well um, you know we talk about cancer a lot because most of us have had some experience somewhere with it and it's a it's a very common disease not just in humans but in all animals and you know in uh plants can get tumors and um so it's a very common thing so the question is why why do so many people get cancer well there's lots of reasons but the big reason is cells have to divide you have to always make new cells to replace old ones or to grow or whatever um, living things cannot survive unless they can you know re uh, uh, 
replace those worn out cells and things. And so this mechanism has to always be active. And so that means that it's always got a chance of messing up. Um, we said there's lots of genes that all work together to control cellular division. Well, that means there's lots of potential for mutation. So there's lots of things that could go wrong. The longer you live, the more you're exposed to carcinogens. So there's all kinds of things in the environment that can damage DNA, that can cause mutations in these genes that control cellular uh, division. And so, you know, you see higher rates of cancer in older people just because they've been exposed more. But of course, some people voluntarily expose themselves to cancer-causing chemicals like smoking and that. Um, and so that's another reason that cancer can become very, is very common. Finally, um, a lot of times it runs in your family. Uh, there, there are uh, irritable genetic mutations that make you more susceptible to cancer. Um, so there's lots of reasons why people get this. Um, but you know, there's also lots of hope. This is one of those things that in my lifetime I've seen tremendous growth and tremendous improvement in the treatment. And I think in your lifetime, you're going to see lots of cancers that are going to be curable. Um, and the trick is, is we just have to understand it and keep putting money into research and keep studying this and try to figure it out because it's going to affect most of us, unfortunately. But at any rate, that's just a, you know, a negative side effect of an important process, which is cellular division. Um, so that's what we were talking about here. If you've got any other questions, let me know and I'll talk to you later. See ya.